The key art is supposed to tell the entire story of the movie in a single image. If you can encapsulate the idea of the story in a takeaway, like when you walk out and you go, oh, now that makes sense, you did your job. Hi, and welcome back to Studio Binder Academy. I'm Brandon. Today, we're speaking with key art artist Eric Reese, who has worked as an independent contractor with some of Hollywood's biggest advertising firms over the past 20 plus years, and who currently works with Lindman and Associates. You may have seen some of his work for campaigns like Girl Interrupted, The Green Knight, The Morning Show Season 3, and Killers of the Flower Moon. And from what I understand, you go by your last name. So Reese, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Now to get started, we like to get everyone's origin story. How did you become a poster designer? Uh, I applied and got accepted to grad school out in uh, Manhattan, New York, uh, at Pratt Institute. Uh, the person I was with at the time was working at Miramax, and she had heard her that uh, their main poster company was um, looking for some extra help. And... I love posters and I love movies. And so I applied and fell into it. And then it, that was like 1998. So just by happenstance. And then I, and then after, see, 1990, after I graduated in, in 2000, moved to LA. And when you're in LA, I mean, that's the movie capital of the world. So. <laughs> I went out searching to continue the, uh, the career path, um, went to what was back then called the key art awards that are now the Clio's, uh, with the intention of finding agencies of work that I admired and then applying. So I, the, they give out a, a program every year and I looked through it and I, put in some post-it notes of the art that I liked. And then I just blasted everybody in those companies with my portfolio, hoping for work and uh, found it and kept going. Excellent. Excellent. And did you have any favorite posters that kind of inspired you to enter the profession? Uh, let's see, 98, 99. I had to do some research for that question. <laughs> I would have meant that I was like, what did I like around 95, 96? <laughs> um, and so, like, well, historically, I like I like propaganda and protest posters hist- okay. you know, over over mankind. I and I like large scale format typography. Um, I really love uh, like the Labelle Epoch movement um, that was to sell liquor and spirits. I guess that's the same thing in in, in France um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I guess the thing that I, le- I was leaning towards that I liked back then would be like uh, Go, which was like at that time a forced perspective of a movie poster, um, which was out of the norm. And then something like Pulp Fiction. And ironically, both of those were like Miramax slash Dimension Films titles which is where I ended up working. I ended up working for the ex creative director for Miramax who left to create his own company. And that's the, you know, so the the posters that I was liking, I ended up working for that company. Excellent. That, that's an amazing story. You know, it's sometimes things happen by, you know, happenstance, but uh, it's almost like you, you were kind of guided towards Miramax. <laughs> I was, I was lucky. I was lucky enough to be in an area. I, I was, I, I'm privileged that I was able to go to grad school in New York and then lucky enough that the person I was with at the time got a job at Miramax. And I'm like, it was like happenstance. So yes, you could say guided or like the universe aligned. And then, <laughs> and then I, and then I kind of followed when I got to that person, that person I was with, we both moved to LA together she recommended that we go to the key art awards to get me back into the industry because I didn't know the companies. And I used that same ideology, which was go find the companies that you like the posters and apply to those companies. 
So, and then I got, I started getting, I got a job at one of those companies and then left about 18 months later in 2005 and went independent full time. Um, okay. So, and then I was independent with all major agencies in Los Angeles every, you know, every so often even did some independent stuff with some agencies in London. And now I'm with the current agency, LA Lenham and Associates, which amazing agency does like, they're like the, the best agency in Hollywood, which makes them the best agency in the world. So every campaign that you've ever seen, that you've seen and are blown away by, they either done or have worked on. All right. Now, speaking of your work, is there a partic- one particular poster that you're just very proud of? And could you tell us how that kind of came to be? Uh, yeah, there's that's kind of there's two, and they kind of okay. bookmark each other. Like they bookmark my my history. One is the first pro- uh, project I ever worked on, which is Girl Interrupted. Um, mm. I believe it's the first project I ever worked on when I was in New York. And I believe it was the first concept that I came up with for that project. So to have the first concept of the first project actually make it to be the finished poster and go all the way up to it being for a competition, it was up for best key art award of that year. So it was one of five to 10 that were in consideration. So extremely proud of that. However, I do have to acknowledge that I stole the idea from the book cover, Kate, that was based on Kate Moss photography. So, you know, there's always, there's nothing new. There's always inspiration. Um, Absolutely. And then the, I would have to say that I'm, I got one of the posters for Killers of the Flower Moon with the company that I work with LA. I got the international poster, which turned into, I think their digital poster, um, and it feels good because, one, it's a Scorsese film, which is a big deal. Mm-hmm. And it's a Scorsese film based on a book about an indigenous people and their play. And it, and it feels good to have been a part of something that is becoming more culturally aware of storytelling. So that goes all the way back to like 98 up until just this last year of release. So those two. Now, getting into the the term key art, how would you define key art? So I Googled it yesterday because I was like, <laughs> I was like what, what is key art? And I, it, but my definition is slightly different from what I found on like uh, Wikipedia. And I think Wikipedia ends up saying it's like a piece of art that's repeated over time in multiple uh, mm. spaces. Uh, yeah, it is. The easiest way for me to say is, it's the piece, it's the key piece of art. It's what you fall back on. So, I mean, nowadays, nowadays we're so inundated with information. Uh, you know, uh, you've got your main poster, which that would be your key art. You know, like uh, ease, for ease of thought, it would be like a montage for Star Wars. That's your key, the one that has everybody in it and all the spaceships mm-hmm. and all that. Then you've got character series, you've got specialty posters, um, you've got wild postings. Now we've got social media uh, campaigns and we've got platform art. Uh, so key art is supposed to be the key piece of art that you keep falling back on, which I guess would go to the Wikipedia definition that you repeat the most often. Um, okay. But nowadays it seems to not be as, in, you know, it's not as impactful as opposed to, I think it's the key piece of art the client buys that then drives the entire campaign forward. Now, okay. that's the broader, bigger scope. For independent filmmaking, it would be your poster, your only poster. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. It, w- would you say that that's kind of the big difference between, you know, like a bigger budget studio movie versus an indie film is the the amount of resources to go to marketing? I'm, I mean, the big difference is money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. a studio film, you know, the math is usually whatever you spend in for all of production, 
you equal that in your marketing. Uh, that's why you, you pay so close attention to the box office numbers at the end, you mm-hmm. know, in the opening weekend, because you're trying to gauge if you made your production and your advertising back. Now, if you're an independent filmmaker, you probably didn't even think about budgeting it for a movie poster and you didn't even know how to build a movie poster. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's, it's the main difference is that big studios have lots of pieces of art. Um, I think part of that is they just, they just need to do big average. It's, you know, a movie is like a product like Coca, like Coca-Cola is mm-hmm. and not Nike shoe. Um, but I, the key art is supposed to tell the entire story of the movie in a single image, which is extremely hard to do, but, but also sometimes really easy. Um, if you can encapsulate the idea of the story in a takeaway, it like when you walk out and you go, oh, now that makes sense. You did your job. And independent movie makers um, honestly should be thinking about that while they're shooting their film, I think. For those who don't know, could you tell us what a poster designer does and describe the general process? Uh, so usually, so a poster designer designs the poster, but that I mean, that's an antiquated term because now we're using, now we're streaming, right? So really, what you're doing is you're making the piece of art that somebody gravitates towards. So we're trying to make a piece of art that's impactful, uh, that you know. Hopefully you want to hang on your wall if it was a piece of art, but really nowadays is what makes you stop scrolling and click on it. Or if you're on the platform of Netflix or Amazon or, or, or Disney, it's the image that makes you want to, oh, that one looks interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be able, we build a poster, a piece of art. Um, that's the easy way to describe it. The process is... There is no one process, um, but there's usually first you get the brief of some of some form. Uh, then you do research and reference collection to like to pull ideation in of what you think represent. Then you use that information to drill out into ideas of what the posters might be. Then you flesh out multiple concepts, present those get feedback, refine, send it again. And then depending on the budget, um, you know, how, how much budget it takes, how many times that you get, you know, you get feedback and, and go down that rabbit hole. I don't know if that answered. Hey, how did what, it? what's a poster artist do? We, we, we make art that is a poster. <laughs> Excellent. Per- perfect explanation. I would, I would venture to say though, the term, the, that's the easy term. What we really are, we're entertainment advertisers. So mm-hmm. we don't think in terms of posters anymore. Even though we still get hired to do a poster, we're mm-hmm. really coming out of the gates thinking about what the entire campaign is supposed to be. What is okay. How are all the touch points going to reach out through all mediums and interact and uh, support each other? So that the social media image supports the billboard, supports uh, a wild posting if you're in L.A. or New York, supports, you know, what you see on your TV, supports the poster in in the movie if you're lucky enough to get into a theater. Now, what technical skills should a poster designer have? I know you mentioned uh, your interest in typography and and stuff like that. What what more could someone have to become a, a a uh, effective posters poster designer uh you gotta know photoshop like the back of your hand i mean there's no way around it if you're if you're not extremely uh efficient in photoshop you're not gonna work in posters um now that being said there's a lot of people in the process so if you're an illustrator you can be in the illustration department um or be a uh, illustrative uh, gun for hire for uh, you know posters that just want to be 
in that vein of illustration. But you need to know Photoshop. Um, you need to know Illustrator to some to some degree if you want to be into typography. Um, so basically, Adobe Creative Cloud is what you should you should invest in. And with the advent of AI, uh, you should probably begin to learn to at least mid journey, and mm-hmm. you have to then pay for the premium level of that if you're going to use it in the real world due to usage rights. So you don't have to use AI, but I would say the industry is leaning into AI the same way that the industry leaned into Photoshop back in, you know, Mm. the mid nineties, you know, some people back then, if you think about it, great posters like star Wars and Indiana Jones were illustrated by something like Drew Strimizek, or it was a single photograph with type laid over it. And then Photoshop came on and the technology, you know, was there. And that, and that took us into that phase of two heads over a scene period of movie posters that everybody hates, but it was just a head, a head. And then a <laughs> movie and the title and fo- you know, Oh, that was done with Photoshop. Now you can go, Oh, that's done with AI but you can use AI as a tool. So Photoshop, Illustrator, and be aware of AI. And do you have any concerns with AI possibly kind of infringing on your work? And then that comes down to the clients if they're going to pay to just have an AI poster come out. I mean, you can spot AI pretty well. Now, I mean, we can see how fast it's moving and what it's doing even for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's still technology and technology is a tool. And it's so if it's, if it's used correctly in the hands of a human as such, I think it's, it's great. It helps. Um, that, that I'm using AI in terms of image creation. Cause there's, there's a mm-hmm. whole, you know, there's AI for automation of, you know, processes and stuff like that to help you move more efficiently and more quickly. But, you know, as, since we're talking about the five, phases of filmmaking, you know, I'm sure you guys seen in, in Twitter X, whatever we want to call it. Oh, AI just made this short film and you look at it and you're like, it's it's not a short film. It's a whole bunch of little snippets put together. (laughs) Like there is, you need a human to go in and actually make that into, into something. So yeah, it's a tool. Do I know where it's going to be in a year? No, because I didn't know it was going to be where it's at now a year ago. And it's uh, obviously an exponential graph. So um, mm. it'll be it'll be interesting. I think you need to embrace it. And if you're afraid of it, you'll fail. If you embrace it and want to learn about it, you'll succeed. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. Now, talking about posters themselves, mm-hmm. what makes an effective poster – are there certain elements that are just must-haves? I mean, they, uh, they're, from a poster standpoint, like an actual piece of printed material, it's 27 inches by 40 inches hung up in a, in a movie theater. They're used to, you know, you need to have, the, there's legal requirements that used to be on there. But now that we're you know, really leaning mostly into, in my opinion, into, into streaming, all that stuff is you can't read that on a screen. That's all that all that's metadata that gets embedded into into your 65 inch Samsung that's hanging on your wall. <laughs> um, from an art standpoint, what makes it effective, as I kind of touched on it earlier, is it needs to it ne- it should tell the story of the movie. Um, if it can't do that, it should grab your attention. It should stop you in your tracks. Um, something that I did for an agency, a piece of art that I created for one of the, for an agency in Hollywood, um, was the green Knight. Uh, it was the teaser poster. Uh, I'm really proud of that one. That one was up for a key art award or now a, a Chloe. Obviously you would think the green Knight, you'd go green and, and it was, uh, uh, Dev Patel's uh, he was the he was the lead in it and it was a big deal for a person of color to be in a 
that's a Shakespearean movie, right? Green Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, that was a big deal. And we made the poster red and we're looking at the back of his head, which is like, you're not showcasing the talent and you're going away from what the title would lead you to believe, which really caused a lot of attention. Like it, it got r- written up about, people really loved it, which then led that aesthetic into the entire campaign when you did need to show the, the people's names. Now, if you're working on a Tom Cruise movie, you got to have Tom Cruise on that poster, <laughs> right? So depends on depends on the movie, depends on uh, the budget, you know, who has legal say on what goes on it. So there's a wide range of parameters for a poster. Yeah, I've I've always been drawn to the more minimalistic, uh, like that. That I remember that Green Knight poster, and uh, the the ones kind of like the ring where you just had this black page with a yeah. circle on it. It was just like very interesting. It's like, oh, what, what am I looking at? It's like I, I have to look at it longer. <laughs> well, the beautiful thing with the industry is we went through an arc, and we're you know I work for LA as a company that's art art forward. The idea is Mm -hmm. let's try and sell the client on art first. Like what would be like, what inspires us? Where do we, where are we looking for inspiration that is, you know, historically classical art that's going to be timeless. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we'll, we'll work on horror films where they specifically want us to go back and look at, you know, 17th century art work because it's a horror film. So what would a religious piece of art look like? We're pulling inspiration from that. To your point of minimalism, uh, like the the mid-century modern posters of Saul Bass are amazing. Like Golden Arm, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Rear Window, like when he would partner up with Hitchcock. Like those those posters are absolutely beautiful. You you know, they, they can be on anybody's wall right now. Now, what role does a poster designer take in the marketing campaign? I mean, I use this and depends on who you're working with. So at my level in an, in an agency, I am a guy creating ideas to put into a presentation to go up to the client so that they can look at it. And then it goes in front of a big group of people. And, but I don't, you know, I can't speak too far to that because it's above mm-hmm. my interaction. Uh, when I work with an independent filmmaker, uh, a, like a director or a producer, whoever, however they negotiated that right, and you know, hopefully it's a, a writer, director, producer, because then that person knows the entire story. Mm-hmm. Um, they're usually coming in with, you know, a minimal budget at best, usually no budget. Then I, then they ask me how much, and then they get sticker shock. They got to figure it out. <laughs> and then we sit and we, uh, talk about what the movie is and so we're like if it's a one-on i i I guess if if i was up higher in the inside of hollywood basically we're, we're partners we are trying to take your baby which is your film and promote it as effectively as possible so we should be equal collaborators in the process um, I find it most effective when I'm working with independent filmmakers is that we sit down and really dialogue and ideate together and agree on what the story is that you're trying to tell in the movie and what it is you want to be represented on the poster. And that we come away from, from the first meeting with an agreement on that so that you're crystal clear and what it is that you want to be expressed in that piece of art. So, okay. Yeah. It, you know, throw enough money on, on a poster designer. You're just a guy making art. If you're, <laughs> if you're really sitting at the table, you know, you're a creative collaborator. Hopefully you're an equal because you want to be, you're part of the filmmaking process. That's why we're, we love film. That's why we're making movie posters. Otherwise we'd be doing other posters. Now, when when you're having those meetings with the the director or producer, are you going through the script with them and like making maybe pointing out points of the story that oh this could be very interesting on a poster? Uh, 
depends on like, there's no one way of doing you know there's no mm-hmm. one way of of the process like, i mean there is there are stages to our creative process sometimes you get scripts sometimes you get a synopsis sometimes you get a sizzle reel sometimes you get a rough cut sometimes you get the whole movie depends on where it's been and and the and who you're working with who the client is um okay uh, I if I'm working one on one with a with a movie director or producer, um, I usually like to I want as much information as possible. So if I can watch it, if I can read it, uh, if I can get your inspiration boards or whatever it is you have, and then I come with my ideas, and I usually give them um, like a three step thing to go through to bring their ideas to the first meeting as well. So we both come in prepared because the independent person usually isn't, you know, they're not working. Their brain isn't thinking about the marketing side usually until Mm -hmm. at the very end. Whereas inside of Hollywood's entertainment advertising, we're working with the client side marketing department and they're doing the same you know we're just doing this all day every day art 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 so that relationship is basically ongoing when do you typically enter like that filmmaking process Uh, for independent films it's usually at the very end when they're like oh okay we need a poster (laughs) <laughs> like, oh, we haven't finished. Oh, we, and it's usually like when it, it it's either after it's been final cut and they're like, oh, now we got to go shop it around or it's coming out of post and somebody's like, oh, we need a poster before, we, you know, so that we can go screen it, you know, in the film festival uh, market. But in okay. on the studio side, you could be working on something. I mean, t- Mad Max Fury Road, that was like, what, 20 years on, I think it was 20 years in the making. I remember I worked on logos for that in 2003 and then never heard, and then never heard anything again. Cause then I guess that, you know, I guess you you could be shopping around that IP inside Mm -hmm. of the industry, um, you know, or, you know, some, you know, some projects, you know, recently we've been working on for three, over three and a half years before it comes out on, you know, in the theater. Sometimes it's a mad dash scramble. You're behind, you know, you're way behind and, and you're like, they're, they're, the bigger the film, they're probably putting it through uh, focus groups and they're getting mm-hmm. feedback and things aren't testing well. And I mean, there's been multiple Memorial Day weekends that I didn't, I couldn't go to barbecues because I was having to scramble on, you know, something like Dunkirk because mm. they needed a piece of art to come out after Memorial Day weekend and they didn't have it. So, you know, five major agencies in Hollywood are all scrambling to, you know, get that, get that out so that that campaign can get people into the theaters. Now, do you ever collaborate with other other artists when designing posters? Oh, all daily. So with okay. LA, you know, we've got multiple teams inside of the creative side. Mm-hmm. And I just happen to be part of one of, you know, one of these amazing teams. And I'm, you know, I'm not the head of it. We have a awesome creative director and an amazing associate creative director. And then our team is super collaborative. Uh, so we get on kickoff calls, catch up calls, you know, we have, you know, we share our art back and forth so we can get inspiration from each other. We share files, uh, on the independent side, not so much because, you know, okay. uh, because an, our director or producer is, doesn't have the budget for an agency. So they usually go, they go to one specific designer and then that, then and then I'm basically the whole. I'm just one person acting as a whole agency. So I'm mm. concept to finishing. So you're doing your production design on the poster, then you polish it up, and then you know there's a whole department in key in the key art world that's just called finishing, which is taking my poster, and if it goes to finish, it goes into a, a department that makes it. They resolve they 
make the resolution higher. They dial it in. They, they rebuild the whole poster from scratch so that when it goes up on the side of a building, it looks beautiful. And, you know, most likely we were behind Taiwan something. He didn't get a good mask in and they got to go in and clean it up. And so, you know, there's the spectrum is like either super independent, one person doing everything or a whole agency doing, and there's all these departments in it to make that piece of artwork get out in the world. Now, considering demographics, how much does the prospective audience play into whenever you're designing posters for a film? I mean, when I'm talking to the independent filmmaker, I'm asking them the, those questions. Uh, who, mm-hmm. you know, what is their primary, secondary, and tertiary demographic, and how important you know is it to them? Mm-hmm. Studio side, you're usually given that information from the, you know, in the marketing brief. Um, and that comes, you know, that comes from whoever. That comes, you know, whoever wants to be in that room. I don't know who's in that room. Um, I, I mean, obviously, it's important if it's a if it's a rom com if it's a, if it's a rom com for, you know, Gen X, Gen Zs, millennials. It's gonna be different than a horror film for. <laughs> You know, Gen Xers, which is going to be different than a than a something for a boom, you know, boomers. But I don't even like right. the idea of movies in theaters targeting certain demographics seems pretty antiquated at the moment because everything seems to be streaming. So it feels like the art has to be more. This is my personal opinion is the art is more related to the film than it is the audience. Because I think the audience is pretty broad if you're looking at what's happening in theaters nowadays. And I don't know how you, I don't know if we're even, you know, do we even measure the metrics on streaming? And then we used to do it on broadcast, but I don't know if we get yeah, that. That's, do, do we? That's a good point. I mean, that's, a, that's an open question because I think that's what part of the strikes were about, wasn't it? Was house, yeah, house. yeah, I believe, yeah, part of it was one, they weren't releasing their streaming numbers, and then two, what they weren't releasing any demographics or any type, anything, anything like that. I, so, I would, I, I think it's important, obviously, like with any product, you need to know who your audience is. I think if you're trying to capture a broad audience, it's more important to be authentic to the film, and then the you know, the and that the film is an extension of the filmmaker is an extension of the producer or is an extension of the production company and the student depends on how big it gets. So I think you should be aware of it. Now key art seems to go through, like you said, phases, you know, you have your posters for boomers, Gen X, Gen Z. How do you navigate those, those different trends uh, and kind of, do you try and stay away from something familiar or do you lean into that? Or you, do you try and always create something brand new? I mean, the, be- the beautiful thing with Hollywood, or not Hollywood, entertainment advertising, is that there's a, you know, there's a pyramid that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. You can have something fast, you can have something cheap, and you can have something good. And you can only have two of those three things. So mm-hmm. Hollywood tends to have some deep pockets. So they want a lot of stuff, you know, good and they want it fast. And the thing that I love about the industry is that every day it feels like you're in film, you're in school. It's basically, Mm -hmm. it's like a new project. It's like, yeah, sometimes you might work on something for three and a half years, but you're not refining one image for three and a half years. You're, you're, (laughs) Oh, this week we're going to pivot and we're going to go down a different direction. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's – I can refresh me on what the question was. I lost my train of thought. It's, it's, it's like – it's just it's beautiful uh, because it's – every day is – is, is, every day is a brand new day. You literally cannot schedule your day. It's, it's like being in school. I know I just said that, but it's like it's a new project every day you wake up. And then when, as far as designing the posters, do you lean into the, the trend of the time or, or are you more of kind of like trying to set a trend at, as, as far as the design of the poster? how long the project goes. And, you know, okay. 
from a studio side, you usually have enough time to explore a lot of different options. From the independent mm. side, you know, you're based on, you know, it's on my time based on your money. So that's mm. the that's part of the dialogue to be with with the filmmaker. So then that's part of the, you know, the three-step thing that I asked the filmmaker to come into our first meeting with, which is what inspires you? Like what inspired the movie? What do you mm. like? What don't you like? What, you know, what do you think the movie is? And then we'll have that discussion. And if, you know, I don't want it to look like everything else out there. So, you know, if your inspiration is current and a bit redundant to things that are already out there, how do we make that, how do we pivot and make it different? If it's, if your reference is something that's historic and classic and it's been around forever how do we draw that as inspiration without it being direct imitation? Mm, that makes sense. Now you, you've touched on this a little bit. How do you feel key art has evolved over time okay. and where do you see it going? It used to, you know, you look at, I like to buy old movie posters that are good. If you go back and see, you know, back in time, it was obviously you had a photograph, you know, probably if, if you're lucky, you had a photograph or it was a still image from the film. Mm. And I would venture to say key art probably came from a key scene of a key, a key, a key frame from a key scene in a film. Like the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, it's like, it's kind it's a, it's a, it's an image of Clint Eastwood. And then you got typography. Mm -hmm. So it's an image with type on it. And then, and then, and then if you couldn't get an image with type, you'd pay an illustrator and then Photoshop came in and that gave you the ability to start manipulating photos and illustration, adding type. Uh, and then and that diluted it for a while and made it not art which was a painful period for a lot of us. <laughs> and now we're, and then we, we went into art and if you can keep it, if you keep thinking of it as art, it's, it's awesome because art always evolves from mm -hmm. a technical standpoint. I, I keep questioning why we do 27 by forties when the majority of people consume stuff on 16 by nine, which is mm -hmm. like a TV screen. So, you know, or your, or, I mean, I guess a 27 by 40 scaled down works on a phone when you're scrolling, when you're doom scrolling through mm. Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, but you still turn stuff sideways to watch it. And so I feel right. like we'll probably be doing more campaign based presentations with vertical and horizontal or vertical, horizontal and a square where you're like, how does it work all at once? Because filmmakers are doing that now, right? Right? Like filmmakers are shooting yeah. horizontal and vertically at the same time because mm -hmm. people are consuming content differently. So I, you know, like I, I can't forecast the future, but I, you lean towards where the technology of consumption is going. That makes sense. That makes sense. It, it reminds me of this T-shirt I saw. It said, please make video horizontal again. <laughs> it just made me laugh so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, what was the failed attempt at vertical content consumption? Oh, uh, what was it? It's like a four letter word. This, it, yeah, like, it's, it like popped up, it like popped up and it was gone within a year. And it was a yeah. huge investment. And they, you know, it was basically you can consume like this, you can consume like this, mm -hmm. but it didn't. It didn't end up. Yeah, it just I, didn't quite catch like they thought it would. Well, it doesn't because the human eye, we we forget how much peripheral vision there is. And honestly, in movie poster design, it's interesting because the U.S. does twenty-seven by forty, and then the the U.K. they do quads. So they to quad is basically, you know. You know, that's Quan's four, but it's like two movie posters side by side, which gives you, which is enjoyable for me to design on. So are 16 by nines because you get 
more world building, right? If I go, mm. if I go up here and I go down here, I'm going to just look at more sky or more ground. But if I go left and right, I get more horizon line. And mm-hmm. you know, sixteen by nines, you know, there's you know, there's a reason theaters are like bigger and wider. So you know, but the vertical also gives you space to go like, oh, we'll put the type down here or we'll put the type up here. Also, I mean, since we're talking about evolution and it's not really here anymore, but the home entertainment phase was taking a piece of, taking a movie poster and put it into a box on a shelf. And I don't know if a lot of your audience even remembers this, but there was a time when you would buy DVDs and they would be stacked mm-hmm. They would be stacked up like magazines. So movie posters <laughs> used to have the, the titles in the middle or the bottom with the billing block. Then DVDs had to move the title up to the top so that when you stacked it, you could read what the movie was with just enough mm. art that you would pick it up and look at it. And the billing block went to the back, which is now, you know, I think it's still out there probably at Walmart. But I don't know, you know, right. what the DVD market is because home entertainment consumption move to streaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's so interesting. I, di- I didn't know that about the, the title mm-hmm. of the, the mm-hmm. DVD at the top. That's, that's very interesting. Which also became, it, it, it was a design requirement, which also became a hindrance because you also then mm-hmm. you usually had, you know, in a movie poster, you, you know, got a, you know, legally you have, it depends on the legal requirements. What goes above title, what goes above art, You know, there's going to be a, if Leo or Tom Cruise or De Niro, you know, a big actor is going to have their name above art, which is also going to be above title, depending on where the title goes. And then there's going to be studio requirements. And then there's going to be legal requirements for for, uh, building blocks. So in home entertainment, you had to like move one of the logos out of the building block, put it above the title, put the title above the art then think about that another DVD was going to be in front. So like, how do you gain awareness to that? So, <laughs> yeah. now we're, so now we're almost to the point where it's, how does the art work? How does the artwork work without a title? Cause you're going down cause you're consuming it on a phone, a tablet or your, or your streaming device. So how does that piece of artwork when you take the logo out and put it below it and just metadata type. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. yeah it's yeah, very it's interesting. Yeah. I, I always, uh, I, I'm on Amazon prime video quite a bit and they, they have their originals to where if it looks like a movie poster, but as soon as you get onto it, it, it expands. So you get that more real estate that yeah. I, I feel like you, you would probably appreciate to be able to fill in. I mean, we, yeah, we, we, we build movie posters because we like movies and we like posters. So we want to have a big poster. I own a, I own an Italian Barbarella. Um, movie oh, wow. so I don't know if your audience <laughs> knows what an Italian sized movie poster from the seventies are, but it's seven feet tall. It's, <laughs> it's huge. And it's absolutely beautiful. Do I like Barbarella as a movie? Not particularly, but, <laughs> but I love the artwork of that campaign and I love large format. So, you know, if you also think about streaming and key art, it's there's your I, I, I don't know what the industry calls it. I call it your A spot, the big spot, mm. the one that slides, the one that they want you to go to, the you know, the mm-hmm. one that you can from and then you've got your larger catalog below it which are could be horizontal or could be vertical that Mm -hmm. are competing with the a spot i call it a and b and the b spot if you click on it will drive you to that page which then usually is another piece of art that has to feel like it's part of that art Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah it's very interesting mm -hmm. where it where it where it is and where it's going well yeah and i'm to tie it into I think there's going to be an obvious AI influence at some point where you, where everybody's going to see it. Like I think people are going to buy into it and it's going to be a little bit too obvious. And mm. it just like when Photoshop came out, like you, it, there was a time period and it was those years where 
not fun for us to design in because everybody wanted the app. It was a formula. It was two heads over a scene. And, but then it got repetitive and it phased itself out. And mm-hmm. then in the, the beautiful spot of, you know, art centric posters, we're, we're still in there. I think, I think the streaming thing is, is, you know, do we still do it? Do we still do vertical, even though most consumption is horizontal? And I yep. love for theater, you know, I love going to theater. So it's nice to see your poster in a movie theater. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> but that being said, I also, when I've done independent stuff here in Hawaii, we usually get the theaters donated to us for like this nonprofit organization that I've been involved with and seeing the whole screen of your art is even more impressive, which is now back to that horizontal thing. So, and that's filling up a whole room of your art. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've screened some short films that I've created on, on the big screen and just seeing, seeing something you've worked on up there in front of everyone is such an amazing feeling. Yeah. And, and, to, and to take it down to something small as a title treatment, you know, your mm-hmm. title treatment on a, on a platform on small format, you're like, yeah, okay. All of a sudden you see it on a, t- on a screen and you can see the little details in the type and, you know, you know, the font that you picked or the, or the detail of treatment, like it's a, a Western or it's a horror and it's got green texture mm-hmm. in there and it's, it's it's RGB backlit, or actually it's a film. What do they do now? You know, it's projected or it's back. So you got light. Mm-hmm. As opposed to a poster, which is a CM CMYK four color print reflected, which isn't as vibrant. So mm-hmm. seeing it on a screen is, and then on TV is even more insane. Like a oh, when like you that. see your artwork in four K on TV, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Well, Reese, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. To wrap up, do you have any advice for anybody looking to become a poster designer? Um, I have advice. Uh, I have advice for a, anybody who wants to be a poster designer, but I'm assuming that a lot of your audience are also filmmakers, so I got advice on for them as well. Absolutely. Poster, for a poster designer, learn Adobe heavily in Photoshop. Uh, go to impawards.com forward slash artists and it gives you a list of all of the agencies in the world look at those agencies send them your portfolio that's you know there's no easy there's no easy way in that Mm -hmm. that's probably the easiest um i have a piece of advice for independent filmmakers who are entering into the fifth and final phase of filmmaking think about your poster while you're filming, while you're on set filming. So bring a photographer, have them follow you around. That's called unit. Um, and have them be behind the main camera. So they're capturing the same image, somewhat of the same images that are in, in film. Uh, and while you're going through post-production, start compartmentalizing part of your brain towards your marketing. So start thinking about the poster while you're still refining uh, the, the final edit and sound design and to, to get to that final piece. Start sooner than later. Well, Reese, thank you so much again for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Appreciate it. And I hope I answered some questions. I probably answered some that he didn't even ask. And no, uh, that, that's totally okay. okay. We love more information. <laughs> good luck to everybody who's uh, going through your guys' stuff. If you'd like to see some of Reese's work, be sure to check out his website. He's also been an integral part of Ohina, a nonprofit that hosts filmmaker workshops and film showcases for local Hawaii talent. Both are linked below. And if you're looking for more interviews or deep dives into the Studio Binder software, be sure to like and subscribe to be notified when new videos are added. I'm Brandon with Studio Binder Academy. Thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one.